welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight, and, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Susan McIntosh. I'm the director of Ciencia, and it is this year's great occasion of the Bachner Lecture, which is given annually to honor the memory and ideals of Solomon Bachner, the great mathematician who founded Ciencia as an institute for the history of science and culture in 1981. In keeping with Bachner's eclectic and wide-ranging interests, Ciencia's programs are designed to promote discussion and dialogue across the various disciplines within the academy. Our theme this year is memory, and we've assembled a diversity of speakers from computer science, psychology, anthropology, science and technology studies, art history, and medicine in our colloquium series on this topic. The Bachner Lecture is, of course, the highlight of our series annually, and we are so very fortunate this year to, and tonight to have one of the true luminaries of memory research, Dr. Eric Kandel, speaking with us, to us. Uh, I have had Dr. Kandel's marvelous book, In Search of Memory, as a companion during my recent travels. It's an autobiographical tour de force. I, I've received no emolument from any place to say these things. It's a, it's a wonderful book that chronicles his childhood in Vienna, Austria, his family's departure for the US after Hitler invaded and annexed Austria, and his intellectual evolution from a budding historian as he entered Harvard, and a future psychoanalyst as he entered NYU Medical School. And both of these endeavors he uh, ultimately abandoned as he wrote, to follow an intuition that the road to a real understanding of the mind must pass through the cellular pathways of the brain. The story that he recounts of his journey to elucidate the molecular basis of memory storage takes us through some of the major intellectual currents of behavioral research in the 20th century. Classical conditioning, psychoanalysis, behaviorism. It's an enthralling story of a gifted scientist who was propelled relentlessly to ask big questions. And it's no surprise to me that this book recently won the 2007 National Academy of Sciences Book of the Year Award. Congratulations, Dr. Kandel. <laughs> What is uh, particularly engaging in the book, and it's particularly engaging about Dr. Kandel when you interact with him, is the joy that he consistently evidences for the big questions um, in his work, but also in conversation. We've had a marvelous lunch and an equally wonderful dinner, and he has uh, asked interesting questions about the unifying nature of science and how do we make that bridge between C.P. Snow's uh, uh, famed gap between the cultures of science and the humanities. And his answer is, why not neuroscience? And I think he gained a lot of converts at lunch today to that. <laughs> so of course, in the 1960s, he began to work with the marine mollusk Aplasia californica, which ultimately led to his pathbreaking work on the molecular mechanisms of memory storage. He is a university professor at Columbia, Fred Kavli Professor and Director of the Kavli Institute for Brain Science, and a senior investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, he has graduated, of course, as I mentioned, from Harvard and the NYU School of Medicine, then training in neurobiology at the NIH and in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He joined the faculty of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University in 1974, as the founding director of the Center for Neurobiology and Behavior. And we understood at lunch that he is soon going to be presiding over uh, a marvelous new institute in a marvelous new building at Columbia. <laughs> oh, okay, belonging to. Eric uh, Kandel's research has been concerned uh, with the molecular me mechanisms of memory in aplasia and mice. He's received 15 honorary degrees 
is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, as well as the National Science Academies of Germany and France. He has been recognized with the Albert Lasker Award, the Heineken Award of the Netherlands, the Gardner Award of Canada, the Wolf Prize of Israel, the National Medal of Science in the United States, and the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2000. It is a terrific honor to be up here introducing him tonight and his talk, The Long and Short of Long-Term Memory Storage, Dr. Eric Kandel. Susan, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'm sorry I uh, didn't tape record it so I could play it back in moments of despondency. <laughs> All those honorary degrees, my God. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I've spent two wonderful days in Houston. Um, one of my close friends, Jack Byrne, is a Houstonite um, at UT Texas, and I come here often. We spent a spectacular afternoon uh, walking around, going to museums, uh, and I always enjoy my visits here, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak at Rice tonight. So in my talk today, as you heard, I will focus on memory storage and disorders of memory storage. Since this may be the first time that some of you are exposed to research on higher mental function, I also wanted to use this opportunity to give you a sense of how neuroscientists go about relating mental function to brain function, and having done so, how they can go on to analyze brain function on the molecular level so as to develop therapies that can reverse mental disorders. Let me begin by putting some of this progress into perspective for you. In the last five decades, we've witnessed a remarkable increase in the explanatory power and range of biology that is likely to have a broad impact on all aspects of modern thought, including how we think about the mind and therefore how we think about ourselves. As a result, when intellectual historians at Rice look back on this period, they are likely to acknowledge that the deepest insights into the nature of mental processes will not have come from the disciplines traditionally concerned with mind. They will not have come from philosophy, from the arts, or even from psychology or psychoanalysis. They will have come from biology. This is because in the last two decades, biology has participated not simply in one, but in two major unifications of thought which bear on our understanding of mind. First, there's been a remarkable unification within biology itself. This is brought together into a common molecular science, the various sub-disciplines of biology, cell biology, biochemistry, developmental biology, immunology, the biology of cancer, and even the biology of nerve cells, the building blocks of the brain. Second, there's been a parallel unification between neural science, the science of the brain, and cognitive psychology, the science of the mind. This second unification is far less mature than that brought about by molecular biology, but it is potentially equally profound, for it has already provided us with a new framework for analyzing perception, action, and memory storage. These two independent unifications stand at the extremes of the biological sciences, and they raise the question, to what degree can these two disparate strands be brought together? Can molecular biology, which provided the driving force for the unification of the biological sciences, enlighten the study of mental processes? Can we anticipate an even broader synthesis in the 21st century, a synthesis ranging from molecules to mind, a synthesis that would open up a new molecular therapeutics? In my talk this evening, I would like to outline the possibility of a new science of mind, a molecular biology of cognition, and suggest that it will occupy a center stage in the early part of the 21st century, much as the biology of the gene occupied center a central stage in the last half of the 20th century. I outline this development by using as example the study of memory storage. <clears throat> I focus on memory because this has been my area of competence. The study of memory has occupied my own research interests over the last 50 years. My aim over this time has been to develop a reductionist approach to learning and memory that might allow me to explore the underlying molecular mechanisms. 
Learning, as you well know, is the process by which we acquire new knowledge about the world, and memory is the process by which we retain that knowledge over time. Learning and memory have proven to be endlessly fascinating mental processes because they address one of the most remarkable aspects of human behavior, our ability to acquire new ideas from experience. This, after all, is why we're part of an academic enterprise. Most of the ideas we have about the world and our civilization we have learned. So in good measure, we are who we are because of what we learned and what we remember. Conversely, many psychological and emotional problems are thought to result at least in part from experience. And specific disorders of learning and disturbances of memory haunt the developing infant as well as the mature adult. Down syndrome, the normal weakening of memory with age, and the devastations of Alzheimer's disease are only the more familiar examples of a large number of diseases that affect memory. I initially became interested in the study of memory storage, as Susan pointed out to you, while an undergraduate at Harvard College, motivated by an interest in psychoanalysis. But as I became immersed in biology during my medical training, I began to find that psychoanalysis had a limited approach to memory because it tended to treat the brain, the organ that generates behavior, as a black box. In the mid-1950s, while still in medical school, I began to appreciate that during my generation, the black box of the brain would in fact be opened and gradually demystified. I realized that the problems of memory storage, once the exclusive concern of psychologists and psychoanalysts, could become approachable with the methods of modern biology. As a result, my interest in memory shifted from a psychoanalytic to a biological approach. I had the vague hope that with time, I might contribute to translating some of the central unresolved questions in the psychology of learning and memory into the empirical language of biology. I was interested in knowing what sorts of changes the learning produce in the neural networks of the brain. How is memory initially stored? And once stored, how is memory maintained? What are the molecular steps whereby a transient short-term memory is converted to an enduring, self-maintained long-term memory. My purpose in attempting this translation was not to replace the psychological or psychoanalytic thinking with the logic of molecular biology, but to contribute to a new synthesis, a new science of mind that would do justice to the interplay between the mentalistic psychology of memory storage and the molecular biology of cell signaling. This synthesis has recently, recently begun to take shape and it is these beginnings that I want to outline for you tonight. It is convenient to divide the study of memory storage into two parts, the systems problem of memory and the molecular problem of memory. In the systems problem of memory, we ask, where in the brain is memory stored? In the molecular problem of memory, we ask, at each of these storage sites, what are the mechanisms whereby this storage takes place? Let me begin with the systems problem of memory. This, at the beginning of the 19th century, was part of a much larger question. Can any mental process, no matter how simple, be localized to specific regions of the brain? One of the great intellectual accomplishments of brain science in the 19th century is to realize that every single mental process comes from a brain process, and different mental processes are localized to specific regions and combinations of regions in the brain. I'd like to provide you with the historical background for this thinking. This thinking began in Vienna with Franz Joseph Gall, a neuroanatomist working at the University of Vienna uh, in a, uh, the uh, turn of the century. So he was there from about 1820 to about 1825. And Gall made two fantastic contributions to our current understanding of mind. First, he said, every mental process is a brain process. Every aspect of behavior is produced by the brain, either by individual regions or by regions acting collectively. Two, he said, the brain, specifically the cerebral cortex, is not a single organ. Different mental processes are localized to different regions of the brain. Both of these ideas have been central to our thinking about mind-brain. Not only did he suggest that different mental processes are localized to different parts of the brain, but he actually localized them in schematic diagrams. And he spoke about 50-odd functions. He thought the intellectual functions, such as causality, comparison, 
imitation, uh, e e evaluating tunes and time are in the front of the brain. The instinctual function, combativeness, uh, parental love, apprehensiveness, self-esteem were in the back of the brain, and the sentiments, sublimity, hope, acquisitiveness were in the middle of the brain. So one of the interesting things that emerged with Gall is that even though he had the fundamental insights to realize that mental processes are brain processes and that brain processes are localized to different regions, he was a lousy scientist. He was a good thinker, but a lousy scientist. He had no idea how to carry out an experiment. So he shied away from clinical material. He didn't think he could correlate lesions in the brain with disturbances in mental processes. He thought he had a much better approach. He thought that theory should drive experiments. And he said, look, when you use a, a particular mental function, Right now. Say something. I'm going to say something. Yes, this is much better. Okay. You don't want me to begin at the beginning, do you? <laughs> so this Mary Widow had a very prominent back of the head. So he thought romantic love, amativeness, <laughs> is at the back of the head. And uh, so he began to examine people with various kinds of monomaniacal tendencies thieves, uh, liars, and he would examine the bumps in their skull because he thought that as you use the particular part of the brain, it would push on the skull and cause bumps to appear. And so he thought by examining people, Susan, would you mind if I were to use you as subject? <laughs> he would examine people and he'd come to the conclusion, very charming, extremely intelligent person, <laughs> by, just, by just feeling the bumps of the skull. This made an enormous impact. This went over very, very effectively, particularly in the United States, where people are very gullible. But in, Fra <laughs> <laughs> but in France, where people were skeptical, there was serious doubt. Uh, Marie-Jean-Pierre Florence doubted every word here. He thought that this was just nonsense. He didn't believe any of this. And he believed strongly in experiments. So he took experimental animals, and he began to remove some of the regions to which Gaulle had attributed specific functions. And of course, being a Frenchman, he immediately went for romantic love. And, <laughs> and he removed the back of the brain. And it interfered with the animals walking, but in no way interfered with the capability for romantic love that this animal was capable of. <laughs> so he came up with a counter theory of brain function. He said, there, essentially, there is no localization of function. The brain, particularly the cerebral cortex, the outer region that we were talking about, functions as one, sort of like mass actions. And he said, all perceptions, all volitions, occupy the same seat in the cerebral organs. The faculty of perceiving, of conceiving, of willing, merely constitutes, therefore, a faculty which is essentially one. This made a tremendous impact and swayed the argument to sort of a mass action, equipotential point of view. And there things stood until around 1860, when Pierre Paul Broca came on the scene, really a giant. He was very much influenced by Gaul. Many people were influenced by Gaul. But he argued, if one is going to correlate behavior with brain function, you do it with the brain. You don't look at the skull. Okay? And he felt it was absolutely essential to go into the brain to see what mental function is localized in specific subregions of the brain.
And he spelled this out quite clearly. He said, if I had thought that if there were to be a phrenology, phrenological signs, a science for localizing mental functions of the brain, it would be phrenology of convolutions, that is, the foldings of the brain in the cortex, and not a phrenology of the bumps on the head. And so with that in mind, he began to correlate, <coughs> excuse me, specific lesions in the brain that people suffered as a result of trauma, stroke, or brain tumor with neurological, with their mental consequences. And it was in the course of this, these investigations, sort of clinical pathological correlations with mental functions, that he came across a fantastic discovery. He encountered a patient by the, by the name of Le Bon who had an aphasia. Now, aphasia is a disorder of language. And Le Bon had a particularly interesting disorder of language. He could understand language perfectly well, but he couldn't make himself understood. This, it turned out, was not a weakness of the vocal cords or anything like that, because he could hum a tune perfectly well, and he could whistle perfectly well. It was a specific disorder of language. Moreover, it was a disorder not just of speaking. He also couldn't write language, even though he could move his arm perfectly well. When the patient died, he did an autopsy on him, and he found that in the back of the front lobe, this is the front lobe, there was a region that was damaged. He needed to name this because he wanted to refer to this. So in all modesty, he named it after himself. Broke was there. <laughs> what was the poor boy going to do? He then looked for other patients that had similar symptomatology. And he found eight other cases like this. When they died and came to autopsy, he examined them and found invariably the lesion was in the frontal cortex. And invariably, the lesion was on the left side. And this caused him to enunciate one of the great ideas in cognitive psychology and neuroscience. He said, we speak with our left hemisphere. Nous parlons avec l'hémisphère gauche. This made an enormous impact on people, that you could localize functions. And not only that, that the two hemispheres might have different functions. Soon, people began to stimulate the surface of the cortex. And within a few years, 10 years later, Fritz and Hitzig, two German uh, neurophysiologists, found that if they stimulated what we now call the motor cortex, the back end of the frontal lobe, they had a systematic representation of the body musculature, stimulating different parts of this motor strip, produced movements in different parts of the body in a very systematic way. The face was medial, then the arm, then the leg. So there was a systematic mapping, a homunculus, if you will, on the body surface. This was an extraordinary insight. And this was followed a few years later by another remarkable dis uh, discovery by the Breslau neurologist, the German neurologist, Karl Wernicke. Wernicke encountered a patient that was the mirror image of Broca's patient. This patient could speak language, but he couldn't understand it. So he could articulate language perfectly well, but he couldn't understand what was said to him. When he died and came to autopsy, Wernicke examined him, and he found that there was a lesion in the back of the brain, in, in the area where the uh, occipital cortex, the temporal cortex, comes together, which again, Having to name it something, he named after himself, Wernicke's area. Moreover, he realized that there was a pathway that connected his area, Wernicke's area, to Broca's area, called the arcuate fasciculus. And with this new anatomical basis, he developed a model, a neurological model for language, which, although highly simplified, this was formulated in about 1870, is in fact still in use today. It explains 70 to 80 percent of the th things one encounters in patients with aphasia. And it works the following way. He said, look at where these regions are located. My area, Wernicke's area, is in the back of the brain. This is the area where sensory information is integrated in the brain. Here is the visual cortex concerned with sight. Here is the auditory cortex 
which is concerned with hearing. You hear language and you read language, and that information gets passed on to Wernicke's area where it's integrated into information related to language, to the perception of language. That information then is carried through the archaeid fasciculus to Broca's area, which contains the grammar, the expression, the output of language. And notice he said that Broca's area is very close to this motor strip, and that part of the motor strip that represents the area that is responsible for vocalization, that controls the vocal cords. So he also pointed out, in addition to this specific model, a general principle. Higher mental functions are indeed localized to specific areas, but not individual areas. They involve several areas working together, interconnected, so a distributed view of language processes. Complex mental processes generally do not come from a single region, but combinations of regions intertwine together. And one of the reasons there's such emphasis on neural circuitry in neuroscience today is to figure out the logic of these interconnections. Moreover, in a moment of enormous prescience. Is it Tom again? Tom, you gotta help me. Is this better? Reminds me of a time I spoke at the Bell Labs in which I said, you guys are supposed to be technically so competent. How come the pointer doesn't work and the microphone doesn't work? This is supposed to be one of the great science universities in the world. <laughs> in a moment of enormous insight, um, Wernicke made a fantastic prediction. And I want you to help me with it. have a patient come in someday who would have a language deficit, an aphasia, without damage to either Broca's area or Wernicke's area. Can you predict where that lesion would be? Anybody? Fantastic. In the connect it's beginning to work. OK. It's why don't we just have it here? If you disconnect these two regions, you don't Patients understand things perfectly well. I think he walked off with it. Oh, I see. Uh, you understand language perfectly well. You speak the language perfectly well. But there's no connection between the two. It's a little bit like a presidential press conference. <laughs> Informa information comes in. Inform this is dead. It's, it's working? Information comes in, information comes out, but there's no connection between the two. <laughs> With this as a background, people began to look for the localization of function for all kinds of mental processes. And obviously, question turned to memory. Can memory be localized in the brain? So that raised the question, where in the brain is memory stored? And Carl Ashley, a Harvard professor who actually liked experiments a lot, uh, but unlike Gaul, didn't think that well about experiments, uh, began to produce lesions in the brain in order to see what area can be removed that would interfere with memory storage. And he used a very complicated task, and he found that there was no specific area that was responsible for the animal learning this maze task. Rather, the severity of the memory deficit was related not to the site of the lesion, but to the extent of the lesion. The more brain he removed, the more serious was the memory deficit. So he came back with a view that was very much the view that the French neurologist Florence had, had uh, uh, postulated. And that is that uh, it's the, the size of the lesion, not the location of the lesion, that it was important. But things began to change in a more localized, regionalized uh, focus on memory storage with this extraordinary neurosurgeon uh, by the name of Wilder Penfield. 
trained at Columbia in the College of Physicians and Surgeons, a great neuropathologist and a great neurosurgeon. He was denied the chairmanship of neurosurgery at Columbia in its infinite wisdom. It passed up this great man. And he went to Montreal. With the help of the Rockefeller Foundation, he established the Montreal Neurological Institute, which was one of the great places in the world. And he focused on human mental processes. He pioneered in the surgical treatment of focal epilepsy. Now, if God forbid you fall, you could create a scar tissue in your brain, and that could give rise to a seizure focus. It could give you with shaking of the limb or twitching of the face or some focalized kinds of seizure activity. And he developed a technique for removing the scar tissue that is responsible for these focal seizures. And he did it in the following way. He realized that the brain, per se, doesn't have any pain receptors. So if you infiltrate the skull with a local anesthetic, you can incise the skull, remove, I'm sorry, the scalp, remove the, the bones of the skull, expose the brain, and stimulate the, the surface of the brain. Patient feels absolutely no pain whatsoever. And that's important because when you remove some scar tissue, you want to make sure you don't damage Broca's area or Wernicke's area, interfere with other mental functioning. So when he began to stimulate the surface of the cortex, he didn't stop with Broca's or Wernicke's area. He explored the whole brain because he saw when he stimulated different areas, interesting responses. And one area that fascinated him was memory. He noticed when he stimulated patients on the surface of the temporal lobe and only in the surface of the temporal lobe, he would produce memory-like phenomena sort of hypnagogic experiences in which the patient would say, you know, I vaguely remember being in this room which is very familiar to me from my childhood. Or I've heard this tune before. I'm hearing a tune that is familiar to me. I'm seeing an image of a friend of mine. And he was convinced this was the scene of memory. I was a medical student at the time, and Larry Cuby, a famous neurologist, actually also a psychoanalyst in New York and Columbia, got all excited, took his tape recorder, ran to Montreal, participated, sat through the operation because he thought that unconscious mental processes were now emerging in the hands of pet people. The scientific community was much more skeptical, appropriately so. They thought the evidence was not very convincing. This didn't seem like memory more of a dream phenomena, a hypnagogic experience. And they didn't believe that this was really an area where they had But all that changed rather dramatically with the famous case, which you probably, many of you have heard of, patient HM, who is still alive today. Uh, HM is a very sad uh, uh, story. Uh, it's a young boy, about 12 years of age. He was run over by somebody riding a bicycle. He gave him a bilateral concussion of the temporal lobes that caused scar tissue. And that gave him seizures, uh, which were difficult to control. So they were able to control it for high doses of uh, anticonvulsants. While he was in elementary school, high school, he got out of high school, got a job and working at the assembly plant. And then after a while, in his early 20s, it became so severe the seizure activity that he couldn't be controlled by drugs. He presented himself to a neurosurgeon in New Haven. He lived in New Haven called Scoville, and Scoville decided he would operate on him to remove the scar tissue of the temporal lobe. But since he had lesions bilaterally on both sides, he removed the scar tissue on both sides, and they removed a fair amount of brain in the temporal lobes, including an area the size of the thumb, which is deep in the temporal lobe, called the hippocampus. As a result of that operation, HM is essentially seizure-free, with very modest degrees of medication. He's been controlled since then. But it left him with the most severe memory deficit you could possibly imagine. He cannot take any new short-term information and convert it into new long-term information. When Scoville realized what he had done, he called up Penfield and he said, my dog, this guy, whom I've operated on, has a tremendous memory deficit. And we are commiserated with him. And he said, look, there is a fantastic psychologist by the name of Robert Nolan, who is working with me. We should learn something from this. 
So Gretna Milner came down, and she studied HF for the next 30 years. She came down on a monthly basis and studied it first at Yale, and then he moved to Boston, and she continued to study. And she described in detail his disorder, and from this we have a modern understanding of the cognitive logic of memory storage. To begin with, as she studied it, she was struck with how many aspects of memory functions he retained, how much he retained. So for example, he could recall everything that happened to him prior to the operation. He could remember his early childhood experiences, he could remember the brown or going to school, uh, sibling rivalry, you know, all the students like that we all experience in our adolescence, remember that differently. <coughs> Up until the operation, we remember things really pretty darn well, number one. So he had very good long-term memory for things prior to the operation. He also had uh, good short-term memory. If you introduced him to Jack Burns, he would say hello to Jack Burns. If you introduced him to Sue, he would say hello to Sue. If went back, he would forgot who Jack Burns is or they ever so well. So he has short-term memory, we couldn't put this in here. So if you gave him a telephone number, he could repeat it, but he asked him a minute later, he couldn't repeat it. So what he had was a long-term memory of before the operation. He had a short-term memory for things ongoing now, but he couldn't take the new short-term memory and put it into new long-term memory. So when he sat down to read the newspaper, he'd read two paragraphs. He'd forget that he'd read the first paragraph, he'd start all along for it. He sat down to have a meal. As soon as he finished with the first course, he'd forgotten that he had the first course. He would start all over again. Uh, he would meet people, invariably greet them. The next time he encountered them, he would not recognize them. Brenda Milner, he saw her once a month for 30 years. Every time she walked into the room, it was as she, if she came in for the first time. So life had absolutely no sense of continuity. For many years, Brenda Velda studied him and thought that this tremendous capability of putting short-term memory to long-term memory applied to all aspects of knowledge, to every kind of information that he learned. <coughs> he could only learn for a short period of time, and then he would forget it. And then she made another fantastic discovery. She found that there were certain things he could learn as well as you and me. And the way Brenda discovered this was she had him do the outlines of a star mark. So you have to fill in the star by drawing in between these lines. And she had him do this Leonardo da Vinci looking into a mirror. So he doesn't look at his hand, he doesn't look at his pencil, he just looks in the mirror, and that's difficult to do. And you and I would make a lot of mistakes when we first begin. But doing 10 trials the first day, we would get better. The second day would be better still, and the third day would be almost perfect. Huh. And this is exactly what HM does. And she said to him, HM, this is pretty fantastic. You know, how come on Wednesday you're performing so much better than you did on Monday? And he said, What are you talking about? I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be that there are certain kinds of things that we do unconsciously that don't require the medial pencil over there. Or, to put it another way, there's a whole class of memory storage that is independent of what HM is like. It turns out there is a family of processes that are like this. We now realize that memory is not a unitary faculty of mind, but it consists of two major forms. One is explicit or declarative, and the other is implicit or perceived. Explicit declarative is what you normally think of a memory. It's the conscious recall, keep in mind, to remember your first love experience, to remember the first day you went to high school or anything, you have to make an effort to go back in time. And this concerns itself with facts and events, episodic, as well as demand, people, objects, and places. And this involves, as we learned from HM, the medial temporal lobe and the structure deep to it, all the hippocampus. And this a defining feature requires conscious attention for recall. But in addition, in parallel with that, there's a family of memory systems 
which are called implicit or procedural, which is skills and habits, not associative and associative learning. These are things like classical conditioning, operant conditioning, kinds of things that the behaviorists study at the beginning of the 20th century. There are things like bicycle riding, playing tennis, driving a car. When you first learn how to ride a bicycle, you obviously pay attention, you're terribly afraid you're going to fall off. But after a while, you don't tell yourself, now I have to, it's going to get even more. <laughs> You just do this automatically. If you talk to yourself, you're going to fall off the bicycle. There are an amazing number of things you can think about. When you drive your car, you know, unless something darts in front of you, you really do this automatically. You don't tell yourself when you shift. You shift automatically. We're speaking to each other. I'm speaking to you, which what I hope is understandable English. Grammatically correct in large part, but I don't know where the noun is in my sentence, where it's going to be. Nobody can know whether there is a noun or a verb. We do this implicitly. The other day I saw a fantastic demonstration, which a gifted violinist was playing the Beethoven violin sonata, and somebody was talking to the woman violinist, asking, how many children do you have, whom are you married to? And she was able to carry on a conversation while she was playing this rather difficult piece that she had mastered. So a lot of our knowledge is implicit. And in fact, a lot of knowledge that is first stored as explicitly transfers to implicitly as we master. And this is mediated by a number of different regions in the brain, like the amygdala, the cerebellum, and in the simplest case, the reflex pathways themselves. And this does not require conscious attention to report. We do it automatically. So this raises the question, given the fact that there are two major kinds of molecular mechanisms, I'm sorry, two kinds of memory mechanisms in the brain, implicit and explicit, that have very different kinds of logic, involve different areas in the brain. Do they share features in common? Can molecular biology, which is this great unifying capability, this ability to create a common language, can it find unifying elements between these two disparate mental processes, two different kinds of learning processes? And there are also clues that there are common features. A common feature for all aspects of memory storage is that there are stages to it. With all kinds of memories, there's a short-term memory which lasts minutes, a long-term memory which lasts days, weeks, or the lifetime of an individual, number one. Number two, we know, in many cases, how to convert short-term to long-term memory. One way that it works is through repetition. Practice makes perfect. And that holds for implicit as well as explicit memory storage. And finally, we've known through pharmacological experiments going back to the 1960s and the early 1970s that long-term memory differs from short-term memory, both implicit and explicit, by requiring the synthesis of new proteins. So that encouraged me and a number of other people to think that if, in fact, these two processes share features in common, maybe one can begin with a very simple case of implicit memory storage and see what's responsible for these features, what are the defining features of memory storage, and then see to what degree this is conserved in more complex, explicit memory storage. So with this in mind, my colleagues and I, and Jack Byrne was one of the early pioneers in this, he was my first graduate student, I began to explore implicit memory storage in the physio, and then at a later time, I went to explicit memory storage in the mouse. <coughs> In a pussy, I looked at a very simple form of learning, an implicit form of learning, a form of learned fear. In the mouse, I looked at a very complex form of explicit learning, learning how you find your way around in space, spatial memory. This involves explicit memory storage. Hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, requires attention at the bottom of the mouse. And in the pussy, this requires no attention. Of the room. Nobody the animals pay attention. It involves <laughs> Let me begin with a plaisir. This is the marine snail of plaisir. Just at a glance, this is exactly the kind of animal you would select for the study of learning and memory. Highly intelligent animal. <laughs> and it has other virtues besides its mere beauty. Uh, it has an extremely attractive nervous system. 
our brain, your brain and mine, is a million, million nerve cells that are interconnected in very complex ways. A plesia has 20,000 nerve cells. Moreover, these are not randomly distributed. These are clustered together in groupings called ganglia. And there are 10 of these. And each ganglion contains about 2,000 nerve cells. Moreover, a single ganglion containing 2,000 nerve cells controls not one, but a number of different behaviors. So the number of behaviors, the number of cells committed to a single behavior can be quite small. For very simple reflexes, this could be 100 nerve cells or less. And I'm going to show you a very simple behavior that involves less than 100 nerve cells. Not only are there few cells, but the cells are gigantic. So the largest cell, for example, is a millimeter diameter, but you see it very well, you can run snake in eye. Many of the cells are almost as large, several hundred microns in diameter. Moreover, not only are the cells long, but they have characteristic coloration, pigmentation, and location. So you can return to the same cell in every animal of the species. You can give them a name, Harry, Sue. <laughs> you can return to exactly the same cell in every animal. Look at the same cell in a naive animal and in an animal that is the nerve cell. Moreover, we found very early on that not only can we identify the cells and give them, but of course we were not created or we call them there, we call them R2 equivalents on the right side and L2 equivalents on the left side. <laughs> but also it is very easy to map connections between nerve cells. So you can put yourself in one cell and stimulate it, action potentials, and see the sign of a synaptic connection in the following cell. So if two cells are connected to each other, if you generate an electrical signal in one, you go propagate to the terminal, release a small amount of chemical transmitter at this point of contact, which is called the synapse, and that will produce an electrical change called the synaptic potential in the following cell. So you can map out directly the neural architecture of a behavior. And we did this focusing on a very, very simple behavior that the animal has, which is the simple withdrawal complex. This is a dorsal view of the animal, so we're looking top down. For the sociologists in the audience, I should point out this is the head of the animal. <laughs> it has an external respiratory organ called the gill, which is covered with a sheet of skin called the mantle shelf, which ends in a fleshy spot, the siphon. So I've pulled back the mantle shelf so you can see things better. Normally, it protects the gill. If you give a weak tactile stimulus, you get a very brisk withdrawal of this uh, very sensitive organ. It seeks protection underneath the mantle shelf. This very simple reflex can be modified by four different kinds of learning. Habituation, sensitization, class conditioning, and operant conditioning. And each of these is a short-term and a long-term form depending on the number of repetitions. We focused on one particular form of learning and done most of our work around that, and that's called sensitization. It's a form of learned field. If you give the animal a weak tactile stimulus, you get a very nice control of the other. If you now give the animal a shock, you scare the hell out of the animal. You now prepare us for defense and escape. So the same weak tactile stimulus now produces a much more powerful control. And the animal remembers this frightening event as a function of number of repetitions. If you give a single tail shock, it remembers it for minutes. It's a short term memory. It doesn't require protein synthesis. If you give five training trials, you produce a memory that lasts for days. This requires protein synthesis. If you give more training, it remembers it for weeks. This also requires protein synthesis. So we were interested in seeing what's the difference between one training trial and five training. So the first thing we did was to work out the neural architecture of the reflex, and my colleague Jack Byrne was instrumental in this. We identified 24 sensory neurons that innovate the siphon and skin, and Jack showed very beautifully how different sensory neurons pick up from different parts of the skin. So there's a map in the siphon, very much like there's a map of your body surface on your brain. Those sensory neurons hook on to six motor neurons and to a family of inhibitory excitatory. The connections between these neurons are very precise. Sensory neurons invariably connect to the same motor neurons, the six motor neurons, and to the same excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And that raised the first deep question in the neurobiology of memory storage. How do you reconcile the invariance of this neural circuit, the fact that genetic and developmental programs give you the architecture behavior? How do you reconcile this with the capability? 
so we thought we'd look at what happens during work. We stimulated the tail. We found when you stimulate the tail, you activate modulatory systems, very much like the modulatory systems at the base of your brain, the cholinergic, the serotonergic, and the dopaminergic systems. In aplysia, the most important system is serotonergic. It acts on the sensory neurons, including on the presynaptic terminals, to strengthen the connections between the sensory neurons. So this really is a reconciliation, if you will, between Kant and Locke. Kant said, we are born with innate knowledge. And by that he meant, the architecture of behavior is built into the brain. Locke said, it's a tabula rosa. We are what we are because of what we learn. It's not quite true. We are born with innate knowledge. We have the capability of moving the gill before anything occurs. But we can alter the strength of connections in a Lockean way. So this is a reconciliation between two opposing philosophical views. We can now see how this comes about. If you give a tail shock, you activate these serotonergic cells, they strengthen the connections, and this lasts only for minutes, and this does not require protein synthesis. <coughs> so this is the time force of the change in synaptic strength. If you now give five training trials, to activate genes, and I'll tell you about this in a moment. It gives rise to proteins that give rise to the growth of these synaptic connections. That gives you a facilitation that lasts much longer, days, and you block this if you block protein synthesis. Okay? So clearly we wanted to know how this has come about. So this is the only difficult slide you'll see. It's actually very simple. You <laughs> can try to explain it in a way that's simple. And it is quite perfect. So this is a cartoon. A blow up of the connections of the sensory neuron and the motor neuron in the surgery. So this is the sensory neuron, the motor neuron, tail shock, surgery cell. You activate the tail once, you stimulate surgery cells, they activate a receptor in the membrane of the sensory neurons that activates a signaling system within the cell called an intracellular signaling system, or second messenger system. There are several of these. Learning often involves something called the psychic AMP system. This activates an enzyme called the psychic AMP-dependent protein kinase that leads to the transient strengthening of connections. The details are unimportant. If you activate a signaling system in the brain that leads to a transient strengthening, it leads to more release of this chemical substance with the What happens when you give repeated Stimuli. When you give repeated stimuli, you increase, you, in, you activate serotonin more effectively, you increase the level of psychic AMP for a longer period of time, and that allows the enzyme to move into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, it's capable of activating proteins called transcription factors that act on genes. As the psychic AMP dependent protein kind of moves into the nucleus, recruits a buddy, MAP kinase, and it acts on another <coughs> transcription factor. There is a protein called PREP1 that activates genes. There is a protein called PREP2 that represses gene activation. So in order to turn on long-term memory, you have to activate the activator, and the only way you can do that is to remove the repressor. So there's inhibitory constraint in memory storage. Now you're sitting there saying to yourself, that's ridiculous. Why would I want to put an inhibitory constraint in long-term memory? Wouldn't I want to put everything into long-term memory immediately? If in fact you experimentally remove the repressor, every single stimulus goes into long-term memory. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You sit in class, everything you put in the garbage, you would remember immediately for the rest of your life. You don't want to do that. Lots of things that you learn are boring, they're uninteresting. <laughs> Lots of your experiences are unattractive. You also want to be In order for something to move into long term memory, it's got to be emotionally charged. It's got to be really important. Only if you remove the impressor, activate the activator, do you turn on genes, and that gives rise to the growth of these things. Now let me tell you several interesting things about this. The defining feature of long-term memory is that you activate genes. So in the environmental contingency, what you are exposed to in life is capable of altering the expression of genes in your brain. 
this is quite profound because we were taught the genes are the controllers of behavior. These are responsible for our instinctive actions. This is really the Kantian part of us. But here, we see that the environment, the world around us, is capable of altering gene expression. The nature-nurture controversy completely disappears. They interact. Nurture is capable of modifying nature. It's capable of altering gene expression. Now, this upsets people terribly. <laughs> this is unbelievably upsetting. But because they say to themselves, God, if learning alters gene expression, I'm sitting here listening to this lecture. Genes in my brain is being changed. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make love to my partner. We're going to have a baby, and that poor baby's going to have to remember that ridiculous lecture. <laughs> to worry. You can go. You have my permission to go home tonight and do whatever you want. <laughs> the genes that are altered in your brain are, first of all, in your brain. There are specific nerve cells in the brain that have their genes altered, number one. Number two, they're altered in the level at which they're functioning. This is not a mutation. This is a regulation, up and down regulation of genes. This does not affect the sperm. It does not affect the egg. It has nothing to do with your reproductive capability. <laughs> but what is important is that there's a growth of your synaptic connections. And Craig Bailey, who studied this in detail in Aplysia, showed how dramatic this is in the intact animals. If you give training of a memory that lasts for several weeks, you see that there's a dramatic outgrowth of processes, both from the sensory nerve and from the motor nerve. There's more of, than a doubling of number of synaptic connections. So the naive animal has something like uh, 1,300 synaptic connections. The sensitized animal has something like 27, 2,800 uh, synaptic connections. So there's a dramatic increase. Again, people worry about this. They say, my God, my brain is going to get clogged up with all these nerve cells. I'm not going to be able to learn. Don't worry. When you forget, these connections repress. And there are some forms of learning, like habituation, which consist of a loss of synaptic connections. So not every learning process is growth. All learning processes involve changes, anatomical changes, but they can be bi-dimensional. Now, again, you know, you're going to say, well, this is, you know, this is a lousy snail, this doesn't apply to me. And the fact is, this is, <laughs> this is the map of your body surface. I showed you before the motor map. There's a sensory map, okay? So the body surface also has a sensory map. This is a pre-Victorian image, I guarantee. Everyone in the audience with the genitalia well represented the brain. <laughs> <laughs> and the homunculus that you have in your brain is a distortion of the body surface. Those parts of the body, like the hand, that are very important tactile organs, have a larger representation than the skin of your back, which is less of a tactile organ. Now, I was taught as a medical student that that representation is fixed. If you're born with it, and that's it. This is no longer. We now that know this is, this is not true. Mike Mersenick did the following experiment. He examined the hand representation. Every finger of the hand has a little slab of the cortex devoted just to it. It's a very nice thought, actually. And he looked at the hand representation of five different monkeys. And he saw that each monkey had a slightly different representation. And he didn't know this is due to genetic differences. It was due to the fact that they had different tactile experiments. So he had them work a bar as the only source of their food for several weeks. And he found that the three fingertips that monkeys use to work the food, that representation was expanded as a result of this brain. And this is now held up every one of the So this is really quite profound because it tells you that every single individual in this audience has a slightly different brain than every other individual, if only because of the fact that they have different social and environmental experiences. Identical twins with identical genes have different brains because they have different social experiences. And, and as your mother taught you, the ability to change the brain is a function of age. If you start doing things early, you have a greater capability of changing your brain than later. This was shown by Traub and a beautiful subject <coughs> from and string instrument players. The string instrument player bows with the fist of the right hand. Very little individuation of fingers. And the representation of the right hand is 
string instrument play is no different from anyone else. But the fingering is done by the left hand. That is really the dexterity of playing the instrument. And the representation of the left hand of the string instrument players is dramatically different than that of people who don't play the string instrument player. if you did what your mother told you, started playing when you were young, the representation is larger than if you started playing that. So listen to your mother's kids. <laughs> they knew what they were told. Let me tell you briefly how this relates to explicitness. <coughs> Here, people, my lab is just one of many, have looked at the representation of space in the mouth which involved in the campus of the medial temporal lobe. And when you spatial task, an animal, for example, has to find one hole out of 40 that leads to an escape hatch. The reason the animal is looking for escape hatch is you put it in the surface of a platform and you shine lights on it. Mice hate lights. Unlike scientists who like to stand and get attention, they hate it. <laughs> the only way they can do it is to find the one hole out for you. They use markings on the wall in order to find where this hole is located. I'm going to return to that later on. This involves information coming into and out of the hippocampus, the structure that's holding it out. And the interesting thing about the hippocampus is it has synaptic connections, just like I showed you in the year. And with appropriate stimulation, there are changes in strength of synaptic connections. And we now know that these correlate with work. If you give a single tetanus equivalent to short-term memory, you get a transient facilitation of synaptic strength. This is not requiring you protein synthesis. But as in aplysia, if you get four or more trains, you get a persistent phase, and this requires protein synthesis. One can look at the molecular underpinnings of it. The early onset, short-term memory, involved a quite different mechanism in explicit memory than in implicit memory. Not always the case, but in this case. But with repeated stimulation, one recruits exactly the same cascade for memory storage, crib, activation of genes, growth of new synaptic connections, as it involved in implicit memory storage. So there are many conservative details. Moreover, in addition to the activators of memory storage, there are inhibitory constraints. And I'm going to come to this later on. If you overexpress these inhibitory constraints, you prevent memory storage. So if you remove an inhibitory constraint, the synaptic change is bigger and the animal learns better. If you remove the basic <coughs> signaling system for memory storage, you dampen down memory and impair memory storage. I just want to show you one example of it. If you interfere with the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, the translocase of the nucleus, you interfere with both the physiology and the memory storage. The early phase of synaptic facilitation, which doesn't require cyclic AMP, is unaffected by knocking out this gene. But the late phase, this is the wild type, this is the mutant, is severely compromised. Moreover, so if you look at spatial memory, animal finding its way around this uh, uh, maze, if you will, this is the wild type and this is the mutant. It's severely common. So this suggests that although explicit and implicit memory story are dramatically different in logic and neural systems, on the molecular level, molecular biology has been able to achieve here a deeper insight to reveal a commonality that is completely surprising. Not completely, I outlined to you reasons to think why it might be so, but I could have raised 60 other reasons to think that it might not have been so. The fact is, despite there were detailed differences, in both cases they involve modulatory systems, activating signaling systems that move into the nucleus, activate genes that give rise to the growth of personality. And this raises an interesting question. To what degree can we use this information for the public good? To what degree can we use these insights to try to understand age-related memory loss? And I will ask to take the last few minutes of my talk and outline how we're beginning to get some insights from this knowledge. Let me give you just a little epidemiology to begin with. If you take 100 people, age 70, who are perfectly well physically, they do very well in the physical exam, they had never had any history of depression or any kinds of mental illness. They function well cognitively. You give them very sensitive tests for memory. You find that 40% of them function at 70 as they did in their 20s. 
This holds for every person 70 or older in the audience. This is called successful improvement. 60% <laughs> show a memory decline. A tiny cognitive deficit that if you fall over time, you may become more pronounced. Initially, it is impossible to distinguish subpopulations in this group of 60. If you follow them over time, one group progresses very mildly. This is called benign citizen forgetfulness, or not Alzheimer memory loss. And the other goes on to this horrible, devastating disease, Alzheimer's dementia. So clearly, a lot of effort has gone into trying to study these two. And I'm just going to give you some outlines to this. Mice do not show spontaneous Alzheimer's disease. They never on their own develop Alzheimer's. You can put in, I'll show an example of that, an Alzheimer's gene into a mouse, a human Alzheimer's gene, and they will get Alzheimer's disease, but on their own they never get it. But they do show benign senescent forgetfulness. So if you take mice, they live two years of age. You examine them at three months or six months. On this task, they do very well. But in midlife, and this is true for benign senescent forgetfulness, it begins at age 40. You begin to see a decline, it becomes a little bit worse than the If you look at the physiology of this, you find that the early phase of synaptic facilitation, LTP, is the same in old and young mice, but the late phase is significantly impaired. This is young mice and this is old mice. What does this remind you of? This reminds you of exactly what I showed you before that you can produce this by impairing the cyclic AP system, the kinase that goes to the nucleus. Okay. So you're in some way or other interfering with the system that activates genes. Now if you had this idea and you got it in your head you want to start a biotechnology company, knowing what you know, how would you think of developing a drug that would help you with age-related memory You guys, how would you think of that? <laughs> Any ideas? Look at this. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you experiments as we well. Let me begin with this. <coughs> if you get something that stimulates the dopaminergic system, it's a particular uh, component of the dopamine system called the D1 D5 receptor, which is critical here. If you give an agonist of it, this is the H mice, this is the H mice on drug. <laughs> <laughs> Overcome that deficit. You can now look at how this affects behavior, and you can see that this that, that old mice on saline, which is nothing, do badly on this, but they do much better, almost as good as juvenile mice in response to this drug that increases dopamine signal in the brain. So you can reverse this deficit part dramatically, and you can also reverse the deficit by inhibiting the breakdown of subject energy. As if we show you that here, that you can again get a very nice reversal. So if you're a mouse, we can cure you very effectively with people when it's not sure. <laughs> but one of the most surprising things, and let me just terminate with this, is work that I have nothing to do with. And that is, 30% of people go on to get all the time. Uh, and there's a guy, Michael Shalansky, working with another guy called Octavio Rancho uh, at uh, Columbia, who was struck with the fact that uh, Beta amyloid, we have to discuss this at dinner tonight, uh, produces toxicity in the brain before there are depositions of plaque. So if one of the major deficits in Alzheimer's disease is the deposition of plaques that are made up of aggregates of beta amyloid, uh, poor processing of the amyloid group. And people have known that before plaques are already present, that is, even before you can see plaques, 
you can see cognitive deficits. So they argued that maybe the beta amyloid, even before it is released in such massive amounts as the both plaques, even a modest amount can be toxic to the brain. So Mike Chalansky took beta amyloid and put it in the nerve cells, and then he took slices of it campus and he put it onto uh, slices. He found that the cells became sick. And the reason the cells became sick is because he turned on in these slices the inhibitory constraints from memory storage. Crept to the repressor becomes activated massively. An inhibitory constraint that another inhibitor constraint which I didn't discuss with you, the regulatory subunit, the psychic AP dependent protein type, becomes overexpressed and shuts down the activity of the type. So he said, my God, if these inhibitory constraints are being activated, I can think of a way to overcome that, what way can we think to overcome? Increase cyclic AP, that's the motto. Don't take that motto home. There are many <laughs> But he said, what happens if we increase cyclic AP? So he used essentially the same drugs I showed you before. Uh, this is now a mouse in which he's put an Alzheimer gene. Okay? So this is an animal model of Alzheimer's. This animal has a significant impairment on this particular learning test. It's a different learning test than I showed you. And he gives it a psychic game the booster, the same one that we had used for implicit memory stored, you see a nice recovery. What is more surprising is the significant implicit is reversed. And most surprising is there is a loss of anatomy. There's a loss of synapses, the opposite that you see in learning in Alzheimer's disease. And even that is reversed from what That is really quite remarkable. And this is only one of a whole bunch of approaches that are being used in Alzheimer's disease. So there is, there are two sort of take home lessons from this. One is that basic biology gives you insights that are not only interesting in their own right, but are in principle practically useful for trying to understand and ultimately try to treat these disorders. And two, there are lots of approaches. I've given you one. There are approaches to get the beta amyloid directly to develop vaccines to beta amyloid. So one is hopeful that over the next decade or so, we will be able to come to grips with this scourge. So let me simply sort of finish by saying that basic biology is not only wonderful in its own right, it is by itself in a, a, a very satisfying end. But increasingly, basic science is being found to be useful for clinical medicine. And that's true for two reasons. One is biology has become so powerful, one can tackle these problems. And these problems are interesting from a biological point of view. Just like Broca and Wernicke were able to learn wonderful things about the functioning of the human mind by looking at patients from a sophisticated point of view, so do we learn some fantastic things about molecular biology by looking at how things get disordered in the brain with certain disease states. And we're now in a position to use that knowledge to try to develop new drugs. I've indicated to you some beginnings in age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Let me simply end by mentioning the colleagues that were responsible for this work, Yan Yuhang, uh, Ted Abel, Meredith, the Clark, Mark Farad, Ruska Bolchalamsi, Neil Mallory, and Min So. These are people that at various times have been in my lab over the last 50 years in which I worked in mice. And this is not at all work that has anything to do with this is Mike Chalansky and Calvi Arancha, who happened to be in Colombia, but was unrelated to me. So thank you very much. And Thank you, Eric Kandel. A wonderful lecture, which you know, characteristically, as I now know, the way the, a little bit of the way you think from your book carries us over two centuries of thinking about a big problem and takes us right to the edge of very cutting edge, edge research. And we are fortunate he has uh, is willing to take your questions, and we're going to mobilize people with uh, microphones so that we can hear your questions. And we hope that your microphone will hold up as well. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> One of the reasons I actually, a purpose, interrupted you is ask you about how you would think about property.
forget people who are not scientists who realize that the logic involved in science is the logic for everyday life. Now, obviously, we have technical competence. We have to have a dozen. But uh, it is fun to think about these problems. And the thinking about scientific problems of ongoing research is very different than repeating a physics experiment that carried out hundreds of thousands of times since you following a road thing. Here you're thinking about a new problem of the Novo, and it's a very different kind of thing. Anyway. How, how do these uh, neural maps or the, the neural connections translate into the ball? We don't know that. Uh, we realize that there is a wonderful topographical organization of the body. Uh, we can understand how this translates into action, into aspects of perception. But how the two are put together in PE, we don't know. We're getting some clues. We're learning, for example, to our great surprise, that you would think thinking, because I can do this without any action, I can think about you without moving a muscle in my body, would be a function of the sensory system or some high order representation of sensors. We have now reason to believe that this is not the case. And one key piece of evidence comes from uh, Rizalanti's work on mirror neurons. A wonderful piece of work. Now Rizalanti found that when he records from a certain area in the premotor cortex of monkeys, uh, when the monkey picks up this glass of water, he sells fire. <laughs> But what he found also is those same styles fire when you pick up a glass without any movement in his paw. So the animal says, he is picking up. The animal's thinking, he is picking up a glass of water. This is how I learn how to pick up a glass of water. Those nerves fall. So these are nerves involved in thought and imitation. And they fall. We now have reasons to believe that autism, which is an inability to see what another monkey is doing, an inability of social interaction, right? in which people lack this whole theory of mind, understanding what another person is doing, that may involve a disturbance in those same regions in which the mirror neurons are represented. So we're beginning to get some idea of how things are the person, but it's a very early stage. Okay. Sir? Where is the me not me localization? The me not me. Localization? We don't know that. <laughs> we certainly don't know that for me, for me, no. <laughs> One doesn't know that. I mean, I, I, I have, it, it's easier for me to pinpoint how I see you. Okay? There is in my brain a special area for faces. Nancy Kinrush, the fusiform face area, only responds to faces. Monkeys have the same thing. Uh, whether or not that area responds to one's own face, I don't know. I don't know what that is done. But obviously, we have a representation of ourselves as a complex representation, probably not a single area, combinations of areas. But I don't mean to give you the idea of my optimism about the fact that in 50 years, memory storage has moved a little bit to give you the sense that we've solved all the problems of the mind. This is a century of work. This is the deepest problem in all of biology. Much more, much more complicated than the genetic code, much more complicated than the human genome. This is the human mind. And we just we have clues to some of these problems, uh, but we don't have really deep insights into the real complex problems. So can we use this uh, chemical knowledge to enhance the memory of normal individuals? And should we? Yeah, obviously this is a problem that has come up repeatedly. People have thought a lot about it. I certainly have thought a lot about it. There's not a simple answer to that. I give you my own opinion. I think anybody who has a memory loss, you know, should have access to drugs that improve memory. Um, and that holds whether people are old or whether they have memory loss for other reasons. Whether or not a bright kid at rice should take a drug like this in order to improve their performance sheet, I think is absurd. Every drug, no matter how beneficial, carries side effects that are undesirable. And why would you want to take a chance, even if it's slim, of having an undesirable uh, side effect, when there are other ways of improving your memory capabilities, like studying? <laughs> 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 Go 
side of the study has yet. So I think the idea of this is kind of an answer to prove intellectual performance. It's a little bit like using anabolic steroids for athletics. I think it's ridiculous. Uh, in addition, it has enormous implications. Uh, look, that means kids that have access to financial resources to buy these drugs and do better in SATs, and poor kids who don't have access to do better in SATs. We've got enough problems in the separation between the rich and the poor. We have to accentuate that by this. So I think there are lots of moral, ethical, intellectual reasons for thinking this should be prescribed to physicians, prescribed in a certain circumstances. You've got a problem, you deserve help. You don't have a problem, exercise. Exercise your mind. Question here. Right. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not really good at biology, but I know something about neuromite. There are actually some st st stimulations for electrical potential differences. So is it possible to connect the neural systems with the electrical circuits so we can like upload and download our memories to the hard drive or install as many CPUs as we want to our brains or something? I didn't quite understand your question. So your question is, can we use a computational system to hook up with the brain? Is that right? Oh, yeah. so just to connect the electrical devices into the um, neural system. Right? Yes, that is a major challenge in a variety of species. Not so much, um, let me give you the simplest example. Uh, in people that are blind, it would be nice to have a visual prosthesis that would give them, the, you know, there are wonderful ways of capturing is happening in the outside world. These are the capture image. Can I take that and convey it to the brain? Can I simulate the visual cortex in the same pattern of activity that the retina would normally produce? Okay? And people are working on these visual processes. For the longest time, we were getting nowhere. When I was a medical student, people were already working on it. So this was in the 50s. But now they're beginning to make some smart products. The opposite, robotics, has turned out to be very useful. There are artificial limbs that are controlled by neural activity that work quite well. So this is a fantastically important area of research. If you think of translational research, this is an area I would move into. Artificial devices to improve sensory capabilities in people that have lost them, or to improve motor performances in people that have lost motor skills. That would be fantastic. I should tell you, that one of the interesting things that has emerged out of this, and I want you to predict by yourself, in fact, I want you to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody has a stroke, okay, and they can't move their right arm, and you are in charge of a committee to try to improve the performance of the right arm, how would you do that? Do you understand my question? Say again, it's some right up. A person has a stroke on the left side, has difficulty moving the right arm. Okay? How would you get them to improve the movement of the right arm? Anybody? You know where he's <laughs> Excellent. You tie up their left arm, so the only way they can work is with their right arm. You force them to work all the time with the right arm. You get some extra connections that are still functional going, and that works quite effectively. Uh, so this is an extension of sort of the learning biology that I told you before to the thing that we come in. You mentioned during the presentation that there wasn't, you couldn't acquire the synaptical connections from one generation to the next. But has there been much work on kind of evolutionary changes between organisms that, you know, the, maybe the structure of the crab proteins or the regions of DNA? Well, there is lots, there are lots of effective people that drove me here. Work at Bictostelia can answer that question much more because they do evolutionary biology. Are they still here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to answer that? Can somebody get a microphone up Can you there? repeat it? Are there genetic differences in homologous proteins in closely related species and distantly related species? Give them a little bit about your evolutionary studies on social behavior. 
Yes. <laughs> of course there are differences. This is actually a great area that's opening up because one is going to be able to study Darwinian evolution at a molecular level. You're going to see how the same protein varies in different ways. Uh, more we're going to see how new functions come in and what is the molecular machinery that comes into it, the cellular machine. So this is a fantastic time for evolutionary biology. In addition, I should also point out to you that this background is going to be terrific for sociology. Sociology is going to be revolutionary. And I can tell you it needs it. It's a field that's really static. It used to be an exciting field, really static. We now have reason to believe, we know, that there are certain genes that are important for social behavior. These people have studied this in Dicostelium. The examples that are well known in other organisms are Corey Bogman's work on worms. There are two strains of worms that go for food in different ways. One strain goes solitary, each one on its own. The other, it goes as a group. They go for food together as a social collectivity. The difference between those two strains is a single amino acid in a common gene, neuropeptide Y. You can change that amino acid in the protein. So you can turn the social species into a solitary species and the solitary species into a social species. There's a protein called fruitless that determines that exists in two different forms in the fly. One form in the male fly, another form in the female fly. If you take the male form of the protein and put it into the female, the female will mount other females and act as if she were male fly because she has the male form of the protein. So you can see what powerful effects of social behavior genes can determine. This is not to say that all social behavior is due to genes. Environment is also important. The uh, mirror neurons are an example of social behavior, seeing what the other person is doing. But just to indicate to you that we're going to be at a completely new level of understanding social behavior in 10 or 15 years. And this is why I think in all seriousness, the biology of mind is likely to be uh, a intellectual force that binds the humanities and the physical sciences. That it is concerned with the nature of, the, of human existence, which is the, 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 the main theme of the humanities. So we, I think, are in a position to learn a little bit more about appreciation of art, appreciation of beauty, music, social interactions, philosophy, as a result of this. Now many people in these basic disciplines are frightened that their field is going to be wiped out by That's absurd. Psychology and neuroscience have been making love together for the last 20 years. Has psychology been wiped out? Nonsense. It's a new discipline that is formed from the coming together of these two, in which the issues that psychology raised have continued and enriched the field. Uh, so I think that this is to be seen as a healthy unification of this, uh, not as a uh, sort of uh, eliminated reductionist point of view, which the church and some other rather narrow-minded people have proposed. I think none of us think that this is true. The humanities are far richer in content. They will provide the inspiration, but this is not to say that new insights can come from biology. I wonder if perhaps we should not end here because we do have a reception outside that will give a number of you an opportunity to talk with Dr. Kendall. So let me just uh, at this point thank Dr. Kendall for his generosity. This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part 
without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.